Father, just as we are made to need oxygen, so we are also made to need your Holy Spirit in exactly the same way that physically we need oxygen, spiritually we must have your spirit to live. But I also thank you that it's as simple as breathing. The Lord, we don't have to jump through hoops to receive your Holy Spirit. We don't have to pass tests. We don't have to somehow achieve something. It is as easy as breathing. And Father, this morning we breathe you in. We breathe your Holy Spirit in. And we expel all that is not of you. In with the Holy Spirit. Out with the flesh. Thank you, Lord. Well, hopefully you've noticed that over the last three weeks we've been talking about discipleship. Um, the church's mandate to go and make disciples. And we've been looking at what it is to be a disciple, how to be a disciple, and last week, really importantly, that we've always got to remember that it's only by grace that we can be a disciple. It's not by gritting your teeth and working hard, it's about receiving his grace. So I wonder how, how we can assess our discipleship. If that's what the church is meant to do, make disciples, how do we assess that? How do we know that we're all growing in our following of Jesus? Because discipleship is about going ever deeper into God. What does that mean? Deeper in our knowledge of him. Deeper in our understanding of his love. Deeper in our understanding of what it is to be sons and daughters and living in that. Sons and daughters of our Father in heaven. Deeper in our identifying with Christ and becoming more like him. Those are the things that we need to assess. Not what we achieve in ministry. Or, or I've done this in his name and I've done that in his name. It's those deeper things that we need to assess. Remember, God is our loving father. He's not our contractor. He's not just handing out jobs. He loves us first. It's not about what we do for him, it's who we are to him. And in his calling for our lives, he calls us to co-labour with him in building his kingdom, but only to draw us deeper into him. That's his priority. Might be revelation for some of you, he's not at a loss to build his kingdom without you. So, I guess one of the ways that we could, we could try and assess how we're doing in our discipleship would be to look at uh, the fruit of the Spirit, maybe, in our lives. You know, compared with this time last year, we've been here a year, haven't we? Compared with this time last year, am I more loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, Good, faithful, gentle, self-controlled. All of those things are fruit of the Spirit, Holy Spirit controlling our lives. So, I guess, it follows that the more of those fruits are evident in our lives, we could say, yeah, I'm, I'm doing all right. But those things are really difficult to assess, actually. 
because there's not a constant. The world changes around us. Am I a more loving person than I was last year? Well, probably best to ask your spouse or a good friend rather than try and assess it yourself. It very much depends on the circumstances you find you're in. It's actually really easy to be patient and kind when you're surrounded by nothing but sheep and cattle in Cumbria. So it's not a constant. If it was a constant, then perhaps I could measure it a bit better. So is there anything by which we can assess where we are on our discipleship journey, our spiritual journey? Is there anything that I can perhaps determine to put in place that would see me in a deeper place in him by this time next year? Is there something that I could put in place? To answer that question, we have to remind ourselves that our relationship with God and our knowledge of him, our understanding of his truth in our lives, in fact anything to do with our spiritual life whatsoever, is all and only about grace. Grace. And we have to keep reminding ourselves of that because we're so merit-based up here. We have to try and understand more about grace. <clears throat> There's not a single truth about God that you've learned other than by grace. <clears throat> nothing. Nothing that you've received, nothing that you've learned that was you doing it. It's he has put it in there by grace. Every step we take on our relationship with him is only possible because he's enabled that step by his spirit. Yeah? It's saved by grace alone. Only by grace. So in every aspect of our life of discipleship, the place where we have to begin is understanding that. That actually... I, I can't go any further without the Holy Spirit's help, without his grace. And that's what grace is. It's, it's everything that the Holy Spirit does is grace. In fact, he is grace. So we start in the same place that Jesus began in his teaching. Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, um, clumps Jesus' early teaching together in the Sermon on the Mount. What's the first thing that Jesus says in his teaching? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is given to them. The New Living translates that really nicely. It says, God blesses those who realize their need for him. The poor in spirit. Blesses those who realize their need of him. For the kingdom of heaven is given to them. The poor in spirit. What's the definition of poverty? It's, it's not having enough to meet one's needs. We don't have of ourselves what we need to live this life according to how God intends us to live. Okay? You don't have it. So there's no point trying to do it in your own strength. And Jesus declares that right at the beginning of his teaching. He says, everything that I'm going to say is based on this. Unless you realize that you haven't got what it takes unless you realize your need you ain't going anywhere jesus says that those who are humble and recognize that they need god's help in order to live lives the way that he teaches us to live they now he says with me coming 
you now have all the resources of the kingdom of heaven at your disposal. If you recognize that you need it, it belongs to you. If you recognize your need of him, God gives grace to the humble, says Peter, 1 Peter 5.5. 5. It's, it's a really upside down kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. So different to the kingdom of this world. In order to be able, we have to acknowledge and recognize that we are not able. <laughs> and it's only in that place where we are then enabled. And it doesn't, that's foolishness to those without the Holy Spirit. In order to be able, we have to acknowledge and recognize we're not able. And it's only in that place where we are then enabled by the Holy Spirit. Try to do anything for God or be anything to him, even if your motives and, and you're so passionate and really fervent for him and really want to get on with building things for him and try and do anything, however good the intention, without first recognizing your need for grace, and it will end in failure and frustration and disappointment. It will. You know, that attitude may be of, oh, I've got the gift of such and such, so I'm just going to get on and use it. It's actually pride. That's pride. Because Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. But those who are humble and recognize their need of the grace of the Holy Spirit are enabled by the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of heaven is at their disposal. So we can't do anything, be anything for God without first coming to him. Acknowledging our need for him and receiving his grace. And that is something that I can determine to do. Because God has already enabled us to do it. Because that is prayer. 1, Thess 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Pray without ceasing. So to answer that earlier question... Is there a, a way I can assess my spiritual walk? I reckon a really good answer would be, am I praying more than this time last year? Am I actually praying more? Because in praying more, I'm recognising my need of him. And if I recognise my need of him, in that place is humility and therefore grace, and therefore, the enabling to go deeper and be a more true disciple. I can determine to pray more than I'm presently doing. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says this. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. More prayer, 
more peace. Which means the more I pray, the less I'm affected by my circumstances. The less I pray, the more I'm affected by my circumstances. And if that applies to that one aspect of God's character, which is peace, I reckon it follows that it applies to all the other aspects of his character too. If I'm praying more, there's more love. If I'm praying more, there's more joy. Peace, kindness, goodness. Because I become more like him. So, in talking about prayer, let's make this clear. We need to change our mindset a little bit of what we think prayer is. Because prayer is relationship with God. It's how we relate to him. It's communing with him. Because as we pray, all three persons of the Trinity are intimately involved in it. We come to the Father through the Son and by the Holy Spirit. So, when I'm talking about prayer, I'm talking about way more than just intercession or petitioning him. I'm not talking about having a list of people to pray for. I'm talking about way more than that. That's one aspect. But way, way more than that. We'll look at, we'll look at intercession and petitioning God a little bit more next week. How much of the Lord's Prayer is actually petition? You know, the disciples said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. How much of that is, is coming to him and asking, asking him for anything? Not very much, is it? Give, give us today our daily bread. You could possibly argue that lead us not into temptation too. But that's it. The rest is either proclamation or agreement with, with his principles but there's just that little bit. And that little bit, give us today our daily bread, seems so obvious, you think, well, why, do I, why have I got to ask for that? Because you've got to recognise your need for him, for his grace. You might think, well, I've, I've got my daily bread, I've got my daily bread every day. No, recognise your need for his grace. Be humble. Give us today our daily bread. So by prayer, I'm talking about conversation with him, communing with him, relating to him, hanging out with him, knowing him better. It's nearly a year ago, one of my first sermons in here was called One Thing Necessary, where Jesus says that Mary had found the one thing necessary in life. And what was she doing? Sat right at Jesus' feet, just listening to him. Even though there's loads of stuff to do and get on with, she had seen the priority of sitting close to him. That's prayer. That's prayer right there, what Mary was doing. Your weekly Oswald Chambers quote says, God does not exist to answer our prayers. But by our prayers, we come to discern the mind of God. That's what it's about. The point of prayer is not that God needs to discover what's on your heart. Believe me, he knows it better than you do but that we need to discover what's on his heart. That's prayer. So as much as prayer is a, is a conversation with God, the things that he has to say, I would, I would put this to you, that the things that he has to say are probably more important than the things that you have to say. I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, I would say so. So it would follow that the balance of our prayer time should actually weigh heavily in favour of listening 
and receiving. Trouble is, that's hard. It's, 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 that's not easy. It's not, certainly not as easy as it sounds. You know, often, and be honest with yourself here, often when we pray we ask for guidance about something. We make that request in the name of Jesus and then we stop and go on and, and talk about something else. Or, or, or actually finish the prayer, right, I've asked for that guidance now, I'm, I'll get on with doing the washing up or whatever. How rude is that? You know, you come to God, say, Lord, show, show me what I should do in this or other circumstance. Why don't you sit there then and wait for the answer? <laughs> but we don't, do we? We go on to the next thing we want to ask him about, and the next thing we want to ask him about, instead of actually, well, no, hang on a minute. If you're praying this, expect to receive an answer then. But you might have to wait for it. You might have to press in for it. It might not just come like as easy as, as all that. You might actually need to wait on him. He's the Ancient of Days. He's not in a hurry. And actually, sometimes, he loves you to wait on him because he's got you there. He's got you there. And he's doing all these other things in you at the same time while you're waiting. If you, if you ask him something, expect an answer. But wait for it. Listen for it. A lot of people have asked me over the years, what, what, do, you, what do you do in your mornings of prayer? What do you do? Don't you run out of things to say? And the answer is, yes, I do. And that's when the prayer starts. Yeah, I do. He waits for me to finish. Have you finished now? Have you finished? Some of it is sitting with a really nice Nespresso cup of coffee and just repeating back to him the things that he said through reading of the Word or reading of some book that, you know, by a godly person. He speaks to us in many different ways. It doesn't all have to be by, you know, sort of like this internal voice. Don't forget that his Word is a living Word. And so praying in the morning, you know, I'm praying there with my Bible open. Because if I'm expecting to hear from him, it might not necessarily be in here or in here. It might be on the page. And letting the Holy Spirit just lead that time. What do I read next? Which, what thing, you know, it might be Calvin's Institutes or, or something else. It might be this saturated with God that I'm reading at the moment. Just something like that, but just letting him lead it. This is what I want to say to you. But reading things with him. Reading the Bible with him. Stopping. Pausing constantly. And, and just talking about that with him. Even sometimes, you know, when you're reading a Bible story... If you're really imaginative, it's sometimes quite fun to imagine you were there. Put yourself in that picture and see what he shows you. It's a living word. It's way more than a book. All of that is prayer. All of that is relating to him, conversing with him, communicating in the different ways. Pray without ceasing, says Paul. So obviously Paul's not just talking about our, our quiet times. Praying without ceasing is learning to live a life of prayer, isn't it? Obviously. Otherwise you wouldn't get anything done at all, would you? <laughs> a life of conversation in everything that you're doing. I don't know if any of you have read Practicing the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. Famous book about just that. Brother Lawrence learning that he could actually have wonderful times with God as he's washing the pots and pans in the monastery. But that point is pointed out to me an awful lot by the doers. <laughs> and actually, 
The praying without ceasing in the things that we do is no substitute for time in the secret place. Because once again, it's not a very intimate relationship if all I'm doing is always talking to him while I'm busy doing something else, is it? I mean, it's, it's lovely that he's involved in it and, and we're doing it together, but it's nowhere near as intimate as me putting it down and saying, right, you've got my full attention. To both. Undi undivided attention to our Father. So ultimately, of course, the only reason for us to be a people who pray, or who pray more, should be because we want to do so. We desire to do so. There's no point in me standing up here saying, you should be praying more. We should want to. We should love to. We should know that this is my lifeblood. This is my fountain from which I need to drink. The Father doesn't want his children to feel obliged to spend time with him. If you, if you go away from this meeting and say, oh, never told me I've got to pray more, so, oh, okay, I'm going to sit down and pray more. That's kind of missed the point completely. And, and really the Father says, well, well, no, if you don't want to be here, that's okay. I'd much rather you were, and it would be better for you too. He wants us to love being with him. He wants us to love our times when everything else is put aside and we're with him. Why are you here this morning? Why, why are you here at all? You're here because you love him, aren't you? You're here because you love him. Because you want to know him better. You want to hear what he's got to say to you today. You want to experience him. You want to experience his love. Perhaps you want him to say something to you personally. That's why you're here. You want to see his kingdom come, that he'd be glorified, that his name would be hallowed. That's why we're here. Well, all of those things are realised in prayer. So, th for the same reason that you thought it worth getting out of bed this morning and coming here, is the same reason it's worth spending more time with him, alone with him, concentrating on him, looking to him. Same reasons, same things going on. And actually, for all that goes on in here, the real business is done in the secret place, alone with him. That's where you get things sorted with him. thing is, the enemy knows that. The enemy knows how important prayer is to us. And that's why he put so much effort into distracting us and putting us off our prayer times. It's why we need discipline to do it. You'd think it would be, you know, we, do, we don't need discipline to, to, to drink or to breathe. But for some reason, we do need discipline to pray. Because we have an adversary who's trying to stop us from doing it. And he doesn't care what the distraction is, as long as he's distracting you. It's why Jesus says, when, when, you, when you pray, go into your secret place and shut the door. He's kind of saying, look, you have to purpose to shut the door, whether it be shut the door on all your wandering mind and things and everything else that's wandering you and bothering you, or whether it's literally shutting the door on what's going on outside the room. I shut the door, don't I? <laughs> but the enemy will use anything to distract you from prayer, even ministry. 
even ministry, even thinking, oh, this is what we've got to do, we've, we've got to be doing this, we've got to be doing that. And the enemy's rubbing his hands. Yeah, they didn't pray first. They don't recognize their need of him. That'll be fruitless. That'll be a waste of time. The enemy knows that prayer is the key to the church entering into its authority. And the enemy knows that it's the spark that lights the fire of revival. There's not a single revival that has happened throughout the world that didn't start with some faithful saints tucked away praying, praying, seeking the Lord, praying for his kingdom to come. That's where it begins. That's the spark that lights the fire. But once we get into the habit of praying and hearing his voice and knowing his heart, it inspires us to even more. It does. And the other lovely thing is it inspires others. Because others see, oh, look, look, look at what's happening in, 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 in that person's life. And, and they're a praying person. Or oh, I, I I, I want to do some of that. I, I want some of that. I want more of that. It inspires others. And it inspires revival. So I'm going to read you just a couple of quotes, a couple of passages from this book by Malcolm MacDonald. This, this book here, um, one week, Mike, Michael gave me a newspaper that said, uh, what, what do you think of that? Just, just read through that. Think, say, tell me what you think of it. And some things were good, and some things weren't so good. But right at the end of the newspaper was an advert for this book. And because I know the chap who endorses it, Simon Ponsonby, and he says, the most exciting book on renewal in a generation, I thought, oh, well, that's probably worth reading then. And so, wonderful, it was God giving me the newspaper that day, not just you. Because this, this is inspiring, and I would, I would recommend you getting this. Malcolm MacDonald, saturated with God. He talks a lot about the Louisian revival, the Hebridean revival. The chap that um, kind of led that revival was Duncan Campbell. And Malcolm says this, something I believe we need today is a vision of becoming a praying church. Prayerful people are amazing. I love meeting people who have a depth in God. They inspire me to much more in my own relationship with Jesus. People of prayer are marked by humility intimacy, tenderness and compassion. They know the value of the presence of God and they thirst to stay there. Such people also make an impact on others around them in the power of the Spirit. Duncan Campbell writes about one such woman he met. This is Duncan Campbell speaking. I could take you to a little cottage in the Hebrides and introduce you to a young woman. She's not educated. One could not say that she was polished in the sense that we use the word. But I have known that young woman to pray heaven into a community, to pray power into a meeting. I have known her to be so caught in the power of the Holy Ghost that men and women around her trembled. Not influence, but power. An incredible example of powerful praying 
was on the Isle of Bonaire during a communion season in 1952. The hard spiritual atmosphere was so obvious that Duncan Campbell stopped preaching halfway through his sermon. Just then, he noticed a boy visibly moved with a burden for souls. And he thought, that boy is in touch with God and living nearer to the Saviour than I am. There's, that's, that's the guy that was preaching and leading the revival and he sees in a boy, that boy is nearer to the Saviour than I am. So leaning over the pulpit, he said, Donald, will you lead us in prayer? And that dear lad rose to his feet and in his prayer made reference to Revelation chapter 4. I wish I could read this in a lovely Hebridean accent. I think it would work better. O oh God, I seem to be gazing through the open door. I see the Lamb in the midst of the throne with the keys of death and hell at his girdle. He began to sob. And then lifting his eyes towards heaven, cried, Oh God, there is power there. Let it loose. And with the force of a hurricane, the Spirit of God swept into the building and the floodgates opened. The church resembled a battlefield. On one side, many were prostrated and weeping, and on the other side, some threw their arms into the air, crying, God has come. God has come. God has come. Lord, raise up Donald's in this church. Raise up Donalds that are so desperate but also so graced to see into the heavenlies. To be able to reach into the heavens, see what is happening and bring it down to earth in prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we need people that can pray your kingdom into this realm. That can see what you're doing and pray it and proclaim it into being. Lord, let it loose. Let it loose in this place. Inspire us to pray. Empower our praying. Grace our praying. Holy Spirit, we so need you. We so need you. We so want to drink from your fountain of life. We need you. Give us today our daily bread. <laughs>